Let's explore something called the fear avoidance model of pain. This is a extremely well-researched model that has highlighted the critical role that fear plays in maintaining our pain experience and prolonging the relationship our mind and our body have with pain even after the original wound has healed. Many individuals who live with chronic pain no longer have an actual wound, but their brain and their body are still living in the cycle of pain, guarding, and fear caused by the original inception point. So how does this happen? Well, of course, first of all, we have an injury. Something happens to our mind or our body that sends up alerts in our system that something's off, something's wrong. It could be a broken bone, it could be a car accident, it could be an illness or even the coronavirus. There's something th that gives our body and mind data that there's something wrong in the system. And the impact of that exists long enough for our brain to start to encode an experience around it that results in pain. Now, this is just basic. You cut your finger, you're going to have pain. So that's pretty straightforward. And, you know, if you cut your finger, eventually the finger starts to heal. It may itch a little bit, and then the experience goes away. But when we're looking at the transition of a pain experience into chronic pain, there are other variables that start to come into play. One we've already explored. This is the idea of that pain catastrophizing. Our brain starts to tell us stories about how to stay safe around the wound that we have experienced. In its most basic form, this looks like guarding behavior. So if you've ever had a stomach ache and notice that you curl over to protect your stomach, or if you've ever noticed that with a broken arm or collarbone or hurt shoulder, they'll put your arm in a sling. That sling in of itself is actually mimicking guarding behaviors, protecting your body. A lot of people when they have car accidents, their shoulders and their neck bunch up as they're guarding around the encoded experiences of pain in their neck. Or with headaches, sometimes we'll keep our heads down or rub our forehead and start to avoid lights or other sounds because we're fearful that those could trigger greater pain signals. All of those parts are in relationship to the pain catastrophizing. And I call those pain glasses that our brain starts to put on that then keep us from participating in our day-to-day -day life as we normally would in order to create a felt sense of safety in the guarding behavior. The problem is that this then cultivates deeper pain-related fear as more and more stimuli get tapped and brought into the pain narrative of the pain catastrophe. And so previously, if you've ever had a migraine, you might've noticed this, being on a screen when you have a migraine can be quite painful. And after you've recovered from the migraine, you might notice that you avoid screens for a little bit. There's a generalizing that happens there. And that, for some people, will become part of the pain narrative of, I need to avoid the screen so I don't get a headache, or I need to keep my shoulder up or my arm curled in so that I don't get wounded again, or I need to hunch over to protect my stomach, whatever it might be. External stimuli not previously related to the initial pain experience now is generalized into the pain story, creating a more, deeper and more complex web of data that eventually leads to avoidant hypervigilance. It's as though our amygdala is constantly scanning the environment, looking for additional threats that could cause us pain or disruption, and even telling hypoth giving us hypotheses around what could cause us additional pain. So notice the hypotheses play right into that pain catastrophe. The story of fear that our amygdala is throwing up and utilizing to guide our choices, often keeping us smaller and smaller in our day-to-day -day life to avoid the possibility of greater threat. Heartbreakingly though, while this may be keeping us safe in some regard, Amy might feel safer. It often results in feelings of disuse, leads us to disability, to depression, feelings of helplessness or hopelessness even panic about the possibility of going out and living our life, lest we be re-injured or exposed to something that could cause us greater pain. The possibility for healing here is really powerful though, because we know that Amy, while she is a fear junkie, 
we also have tools to help her recover and heal. So as you've been going through this pain series videos, and I hope you re-watch and re-experience the guided meditations, you are slowly healing your amygdala. And of course, if you notice that you are having some bigger levels of pain or some greater fear reactivity, it's a great opportunity to reach out to a practitioner and do some deeper work. We have a wonderful team. I've also trained hundreds of wonderful practitioners around the world. So feel free to reach out and we'll get you connected to somebody who can deepen your healing journey and help you on your recovery experience. Thank you.